You know, if you don't know what you should do with your life, you don't know who you should be, sometimes you think about that as what career you should pursue. But here's another way of thinking about it. It's kind of a SEALs ethos that Congressman Crenshaw detailed out. Here's some things you could be. Those are my words. These are his. You'll be someone who's never late. You will be someone who takes care of his men, gets to know them, and puts their needs before yours. You will be someone who does not quit in the face of adversity. You will be someone who takes charge and leads when no one else will. You will be detail-oriented, which you discuss a lot in later sections of the book, always vigilant, attentive. You will be aggressive in your actions, but never lose your cool. You will have a sense of humor, because sometimes that is all that can get you through the darkest hours. You will work hard and perform, even when no one is watching. You'll be creative and think outside the box, even if it gets you in trouble. You're a rebel, but not a mutineer. You are a jack of all trades and master of none. And then you follow that a little later with this paragraph these paragraphs. Be aggressive enough to kill the enemy, but immediately calm enough not to scare the little old lady. You'll be that man who's mentally tough enough to operate in horrific chaos, then immediately transition to tranquility, all without mentally breaking. You will effectively transition from hyper-masculine aggressor to gentle caretaker. You'll be both a warrior and a gentleman. The qualities that made SEAL leaders great were rarely physical in nature. They listened. They empowered their team to be successful, carefully entrusting individuals with additional responsibility. It's a real conservative ethos there. They highlighted good performance publicly and criticized bad performance privately. And so, well, you know, those are lists of virtues and Maybe they're not the only list of possible virtues, probably not. But if you're lost and you don't know where to start, practicing, you know, you also talk about this idea that, uh, this is an Aristotelian idea, you know, that we, we are our habits, we become what, I, what we practice. And if, imagine, if you're lost and you're listening, you think, well, you find some things admirable. Well, you could practice those things and you can practice them locally and minimally in your own relationships and you can start to get good at them and as you get good at them well you get better at them right and then you can you can broaden out the scope of your action into a wider purview so you said here too let, let's go for another quote here throughout your life this is very practical advice too and i think it's very wise from a therapeutic perspective throughout your life you have people you look up to Okay, so let's think about that. You look up. What does that mean? Why up? Well, up is something that beckons from a distance. It's like a light on a hill. And we automatically assume that those who we admire are people we look up to. So that specifies a, a distance and a direction. And it's uphill. It's up toward the higher vista, let's say. So there are automatically people who who elicit that spirit in you. You have noticed the way. It might Go also ahead. imply might also imply that there's some sense of struggle required to get to that point because it's easier yes. to go downhill than it is uphill. Yes, definitely. That's right. It's an uphill it's an uphill trek and it's also implies judgment because if someone's above you then they also serve as a judge or you serve as a judge in relationship to them because you compare yourself unfavorably with them and that can also inspire you to tear them down that's really the story of Cain and Abel and that's that's a major story you have noticed the way a teacher parent co-worker mentor or friend interacts with others and you come away thinking hmm that behavior simply works better they are respected admired and successful and you find yourself wondering why that is. You do if you're a little bit humble instead of being envious, right? Because otherwise you think, well, that damn crook, he just stole his position and that's why he's got it. But if you're a bit humble, you might think, well, no, that guy looks successful. Maybe he knows something I don't. You are noticing attributes and character traits that are good and worth aspiring to. 
you are noticing attributes that make certain people more successful than others. You are noticing what a hero looks like. And in the process, you are discovering a path made up of desirable personality traits that helps you ascend in social hierarchies. That's Jacob's ladder, by the way, that, that ladder that is the hierarchy to the good. That's the vision Jacob has of the pathway to God, is that it's a hierarchical structure with the thing that's ultimately good at the pinnacle, by definition, right? The best of all possible goods. And then there are intermediary structures all the way up and beings inhabiting those structures. And this isn't metaphysical. It's like, if you find someone you admire, the reason you admire them is because they're higher up in that heavenly hierarchy, so to speak, than you are. And your whole nervous system tells you that. You're compelled to listen, you're compelled to pay attention by your own, by the action of your own unconscious mind. You know, what's interesting about the, this point of identifying these heroes or, or, or at least role models, you can call them either one. I just thought heroes was a more compelling word to use for, for the sake of writing it. But what's interesting about it too is how pop culture actually plays a pretty important part of this because like there's plenty of people who simply don't have these good role models in their lives and, and you have to acknowledge that. And so where, where are they supposed to turn? And it's maybe one of the reasons that it's so important to fight these cultural wars that, that you and I engage in on a, on a fairly regular basis, that they become a serious part of our politics, which at the, at the same time is necessary, but also deeply, deeply unfortunate. Um, mm -hmm. I do think I do think the, the attack on pop culture from this, this progressive victimhood left has reached a, reached a ceiling. I think there's a, there's a serious um, backlash uh, I, you know, you look at movies like Top Gun, the recent one, mm -hmm. Top Gun, and maybe mm -hmm. like the highest grossing of all time. Absolutely phenomenal movie. Really fun to watch. Why? Because it just had all of these classical virtues in, in, infused within it about relationships and about how you treat people and what the consequences are for treating people as such that these things speak to people in a deeper way. They can't necessarily articulate them, but they, yeah. can, they understand it when they see it. And there's, there's these sort of radical minorities that are very loud that want that changed. You know, they, they want something else uh, to be on that hill. But people react against it because it's not it's not true. There's no truth to that. Yeah, well, yeah, and something cries out from inside of them then, and, that's, and that can be appealed to by a storyteller. I saw the same thing in the Marvel Avengers series, is that there is a return to any, any wide range of classical virtues, certainly brotherhood, uh, a kind of a military ethos, sacrifice, a, a striving upward, certainly masculine virtues, the combination of the Hulk and Iron Man, for example, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a, there's a monstrous element to the Hulk, but he's a hero in a strange sense. And he's also the revitalizing force for Iron Man when he just about dies. And, and that's all the reason those movies were so necessary and so attractive is because they are in fact addressing a radical conceptual void in the culture and it's a void that well that you're addressing in your book especially with your appeal well trifold appeal let's say to duty responsibility and humor at the same time right which is a kind of stoicism in the face of catastrophe you know so because this is a big problem in life imagine you're aiming for something and then something happens to make it impossible or you find out that it's the wrong thing because you're aiming in the wrong direction well, so then what do you have to rely on to set you right? It's not your aim, obviously, but it might be your capacity to take new aim. And that's bloody well dependent on your character. That's for sure. And so I don't think there is a more fundamental aim than what you should be. And there is no fundament, no better way of characterizing what you should be than that you should fortify your character.